Welcome everybody to our Government Affairs Committee meeting for March. It's already March. Wow. I feel like it was still March from last time. Um, but welcome. I want to let you know that we are recording this meeting. Um, so just to be aware of that, if you are not interested in being recording, being recorded, um, just want to make sure everyone knows that we are recording. Uh, today we have um, a really great agenda. I'm excited to share with you that um, we have uh, Jim Ambrosio. Did I say that right? Jim? Yep. Okay, got it. I'm yeah. from EDCO, the general manager of EDCO, joining us to talk about residential organics recycling. We're excited to hear about that. And then we'll also hear from Chris Megason from Solutions for Change. And then, of course, we'll have all of our, our, our governmental updates and other agency updates. So with that, it's 12.03, so let's get rolling. Uh, Jim, take it away. All right. Thank you. Thanks uh, for having me. Let me pull some slides up here, and I'll uh, get started on the presentation. Okay. All right. Are the slides visible to everybody, hopefully? Yes, we can see them. Thank you. All right, good. Well, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, um, thank you for that introduction. My name is Jim Ambroso. I'm the general manager for EDCO, uh, overseeing our North County, uh, San Diego County operations. Um, I have um, placed Elmer Heap uh, just a little over a year, just a little less than a year ago, actually. Many of you knew Elmer, and he is now in the uh, cold Michigan uh, upper Midwest uh, location and freezing his, his you know what off. So, um, but uh, we really do miss Elmer, um, but I'm grateful to be here and uh, to be overseeing the company's operations. Uh, I try to keep an eye on Margo. It's impossible. I'll just let everybody know that right now. Um, but uh, we're grateful to have Margo and, and many others, uh, good people on our team. Um, I appreciate this opportunity to talk about the new organics program. We have uh, a lot of changes taking place in the state of California. Uh, both residentially and commercially with regards to how we collect and manage our organic waste. And I'll give you a little more flavor about what we're talking about here through this presentation. Uh, but I'll tell you a little bit about what we're, uh, what the laws are, are what's changing, how it impacts uh, both residents, but primarily businesses, because I think our audience here is, is, is business focused. And um, give you some idea on the timeline, uh, but what to expect and what EDCO is doing to uh, totally take care of this for all of you. So let's just jump right into this if I can. Um, uh, but a little bit about EDCO. I think many of you have known us for many years. Hopefully, if you live in the community or around the community here in North County, uh, we have uh, been providing service since 1967. We're family-owned business. The owner uh, lives in South County and um, has uh, been actively involved in all over the cities uh, through the county here, uh, but still actively involved in the business. Um, as you probably already know, we provide residential, commercial, and roll-off, uh, really a full-service provider. Pretty much anything you need to manage your waste and recycling materials, that's, that's us. Um, we hope that we are, are doing a good job, and if we're not, we really want to hear from you. Um, vertically integrated company, and what that means is that we have, we're not a landfill company. We don't own landfills. We don't want to own landfills. And so we recycle, 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 meaning that we've invested in this infrastructure to provide recycling for the, the, the typical stuff like the bottles, cans, paper, cardboard, all of that. We have infrastructure to sort and, and uh, separate all those materials into useful commodities that we can reintroduce back into the uh, commodity streams. But we also uh, built the infrastructure for construction demolition waste. And now, as you're going to hear about, we're also developing infrastructure for commercial and res uh, residential organics. So that includes food waste and, and green waste and, and wood and other materials like that. Uh, our dedicated team, uh, Margo being definitely one of the key ones there, we've uh, had uh, an average, our team averages 15.5 years of employment with the company. We just are so fortunate to have strong, committed people that uh, keep coming to work every day. So we're grateful for that. So what's coming on down the line? Uh, over the last, really the last six years, uh, the state of California has been very um, progressive in a sense of moving forward with aggressive new regulations to tackle uh, organic waste. Uh, we've done a real good job of collecting bottles and cans and paper and cardboard and recycling it. But to really get us to the next level, we've got to focus on organics. And so the first law that was passed was 1826. And 1826 was uh, called the Mandatory Commercial Organics Recycling. And it put the onus on the commercial businesses in California 
to uh, separate your food waste organics uh, and to find a way to recycle it. Well, the challenge we had when it was passed was there really wasn't any place to take it. We'd gladly separate it, but where could we go? There were some compost sites out there, but compost sites really were not set up for food. They were set up for green waste primarily and wood waste and done a good job at that. But we really needed to develop additional infrastructure to really make 1826 work well for everyone. Um, then along came 1594, which also uh, impacted green waste primarily. We used to take green waste, for example, and shred it up and use it in our landfills for daily cover, covering the trash. Beginning of 2020, that went away. So now we had to find a home for green waste uh, and really drove it into composting. Recognizing that we needed a, a better program um, and further that we had to focus more on the air quality concerns, SB 1383 was passed. Now that was a law that was really focusing not just on physically changing your behavior, stop putting food in, the, in, your, in your trash bin, but it looked at landfills. It said, what are we putting in the landfills and what kind of gases are being created there that are impacting um, our, our greenhouse gas uh, impacts overall? And so they developed this law. It's very comprehensive. It really is the become the standard of extensive organics recycling now, not only in California, but other, other parts of the, the country. Uh, 1383 is, as I said, very comprehensive, and in it, it sets some very far-reaching thresholds of reducing organic waste going into landfills. So the first goal was set for 2020 that said we need a 50% reduction in landfill organics. Um, sadly, we didn't make that, but the only reason we didn't make it is because, again, we didn't have infrastructure out there to take the material and process it uh, effectively. Um, so the regulation now is set to take effect the beginning of Jan uh, well, January 1 of 2022. And then there's another threshold out there at 2025 to reduce organics by 75%. So what's happening is we're getting a little bit of a slow start in this program, but it's gonna take effect. And our job working with the city of Vista now is to get our, our residents and our businesses prepared to recycle organics by the first of next year. <clears throat> there's a anticipated startup uh, in this meaning that they're allowing two years for us to really get it dialed in, get people set up with containers and, and the right program. Um, there's also a component in here, by the way, that involves uh, taking edible food from restaurants and grocery stores that, that they normally would throw away that still may be edible to see if we can put that back into a useful place where others and where individuals can still consume that food. And there's a drive to do that over the next two years in 2023, 2024. Uh, and the goal is that by that period of time, we'll have 20% of the recoverable food recirculated into uh, places where people can uh, use it, like food banks, for example. Um, there's faith-based organizations out there that are setting up places where folks that have um, a need for food, they can come and get that. So. This whole thing is, is evolving. It needs more structure and, and that's happening as we speak of how we're gonna do these things. And today I'm gonna give you a little idea of how EDCO is gonna roll out the collection and processing side of this, how you'll be impacted or how you can participate, how we're gonna help you uh, um, comply with this. And then um, over time they'll just know it's, this is a really a three, four year period of time where it's really gonna begin to, to take effect. So what's driving this? Well, I mentioned earlier that there's very little infrastructure. So EDCO anticipated that coming uh, all of but eight years ago and began the process of permitting and now building a new anaerobic digester facility. Uh, this is a facility that can take organic waste and convert it into renewable resources, such as renewable natural gas and fertilizer products. Um, this is a schematic of it. I'll tell you uh, how we've done. Um, uh, let me tell you a little bit about anaerobic digestion, first of all, because not everybody knows what that means. Uh, anaerobic digestion is a way of breaking down organic materials using bacteria or organisms that uh, operate in a oxygen-free environment. You may be familiar with composting because a lot of people do composting. Composting is a similar process where you take green waste primarily and some food and you, have, you mix it up in an oxygenated environment, meaning there's air in there and those bacteria thrive on air and organics. Anaerobic includes bacteria that thrive and then without air. And so what they do is they produce, um, well, as I said, methane gas. Uh, and uh, that, that methane gas is a very potent uh, greenhouse gas. 
Uh, today, we put our waste in landfills and greenhouse gases are emitted. Methane is emitted into the atmosphere. And that's what's driving this regulation is that we've got to stop doing that. We've got to get it captured. And so this digester facility is completely enclosed. It captures the methane from these organic uh, materials in a safe way. And what we'll do is we'll actually pump it back into the pipeline after we clean it and we'll use it to, to power our trucks. So as we get this program going, our trucks are going to be uh, running on re your food and green waste materials that we will be um, uh, creating a, re a renewable resource and powering our vehicles. Here's a little bit of the development of that digester facility over there in uh, Escondido is where we built it. You'll see they consist of these big tanks. Uh, the tanks inside have a big rotor that uh, turns and what we'll do is we'll put green waste and food waste mixed together in there and it'll slowly turn it over the period of two weeks. And uh, it'll be heated to 131 degrees where uh, the bacteria again consume all this stuff, create methane, but also kill all the pathogens in the remaining uh, material that comes out the back. And uh, that material then is a, a root nutrient rich fertilizer that will, will cure a little bit, process it a little bit, and then it can go back out on our fields and uh, return those nutrients back to the agricultural community. Here's a picture of it today. Uh, we now have the tanks completed the first two and there's two more we'll add uh, later. But uh, in the middle there is a bunch of pipes. That's where we clean and the gas and we prepare, prepare to put it right back into the pipeline. Uh, we actually have to clean it so it's better quality than what SDG&E even has uh, servicing our homes today. So EDCO's collection program, um, it'll involve both residents and businesses, as I mentioned. It won't change the container types. We'll continue to use gray containers for trash, blue for your recyclables, but our green waste containers will be expanded to include food waste added there. So if you have a green waste collection program at home today or at, at your business, we'll allow you to add food waste to those containers and eliminate adding yet a fourth container and a fourth truck going down the street. Uh, if you don't have green waste, which most businesses don't, for example, restaurants and whatnot or grocery stores, we will be providing uh, containers or at least uh, maybe using your containers and allowing you to, uh, to uh, uh, let us pick that up in a bin, perhaps like you see here, or carts. Uh, but um, the idea is how do we then separate the food in your business? Residentially, I'll just touch this quickly as uh, uh, this program is rolling, rolled out, started already, uh, this week, March 1st uh, in Vista. So you probably have gotten some literature from us that uh, described how this program works. In it, we also talked about this kitchen caddy that you can secure. It's this device over here in the picture, a uh, little container that we're offering for free to residents for you to separate food in your kitchen. And uh, it works quite well. It, it controls odors very well. People are always worried about odors, but it does work really, really well. Um, and um, you can put your food scraps in there you can put food soiled paper in there. For example, uh, napkins, um, paper plates, paper cups, uh, paper towels even uh, can all go in there with your food. So if you wipe a plate, just take a paper towel, wipe it and just put it right in there. Um, these are things that we can expand and I'll show you the list of things we can take. It's quite broad. Uh, most any food we can put in there. And what you do then is when that caddy fills up, you can take it out to your green waste cart and just dump it in your green waste cart. What a lot of folks are doing is taking it and emptying it actually into a paper bag or maybe on some newspapers, rolling it up in a form of a burrito or close the paper bag and just put that in your green waste cart. Whatever works for you is fine. The caddy isn't anything magical. It's just a tool you can use to help you separate food in your kitchen and take it out. It's a great program. Um, I really urge people to get on it uh, and try it. It's not as bad as you might think. In fact, I think you'll like it along the way. But you also can include food scraps in your green waste cart, which you're doing now, including wood and lumber, uh, things like that uh, can all be combined. Uh, when I mentioned food, soil, paper, the one thing I always get asked is what about pizza boxes? Uh, you probably have learned, I hope that over the years, the regular recycling pizza boxes are no good because they are contaminated with cheese and sauce and other things. Well, this program loves it. So you can now put your, your pizza boxes in your green waste cart and uh, we'll mix it in there and, and uh, and uh, digest it with the rest of the food. Commercial businesses, a lot of you are probably wondering, what about my commercial business? Well, that program is also included in this now, and uh, it's gonna roll out after the residential, and I'll talk about the schedule later on. But our next approach in phase two will be to approach our multifamily customers. 
the, um, the condos, apartments, mobile home parks. And these are gonna require a little more handholding. And so we have a team of field representatives that are gonna be coming out and, and talking to you. They're gonna be looking at your individual situations and see what works for you. Do you quit with a, a simple cart, a community cart work for your, your apartment um, residents? Or do you need a bin, a two yard bin that they can all use and where do we put it? Many of your enclosures are full right now. You don't have room for additional containers. So we wanna help you figure that out as best we can. Um, if for some reason it doesn't work, it doesn't fit, there's just no way to do it. Uh, there is an exemption process in the law that we can complete, uh, help you complete that application, which the City of Vista will be involved in as well. But uh, our mission is to help you figure it out and we'll give you containers, carts, whatever it needs to uh, try to see if we can accommodate it. The rest of the businesses will be the third phase and that'll come with what they call tier one and tier two generators. This will be in the second half of this year. Uh, we'll start with the larger producers like grocery stores, large restaurants, um, those places that generate a lot of food. We'll be working with them again on a hand, uh, kind of holding their hand a little bit and helping them design a program that makes sense. In many instances, if we do a good job of separating food, we can reduce your trash bill, your trash services, because uh, all we're really doing is we're shifting it from your trash to an organics cart or container. So by doing that, hopefully we can reduce one side of your costs uh, because this program will have some additional costs. We'll have to uh, try to accommodate that or reduce that impact as much as possible. So what could be digested? Here's a long list of things, but it uh, pretty much includes any kind of commercial foods, uh, residential foods, commercial foods, scraps, things that may come from your production even as well. If you have are producing food in the, in the, in the city, um, there, we wanna talk to you about that. There's scraps, overruns, off spec food. Packaged food is okay. That's a question we get a lot uh, from the commercial businesses is, let's take a, a grocery store. You pull stuff off the shelf, it's already packaged. It's wrapped in maybe cellophane. It may have a, a styrofoam um, base to it, may have some cardboard, may have some plastic in it. Uh, you're not gonna have someone stand there and open up every package of a, a vegetable perhaps and uh, into a container. So we'll take that combined in its packaging and we'll depackage it at our facility. Uh, we have a big machine that actually separates all that. So we will actually talk to you about it, figure out the best way for you to get that material out safely so we can pick it up on your docks uh, and uh, get it removed. But it also includes other things, like I mentioned already, paper products, wood, uh, even organic textiles and carpets, manure, things like that that are generated. Uh, those are all organics that we have to get out of the landfill. We'll provide a special way to collect each of those for you. The one thing I wanna caution, and I say this here is you know, no plastics, but that's primarily for the residents, uh, as is the businesses. We will, um, uh, then I say residents because they're mixing it with green waste. Once they mix a plastic bag and green waste, it's really hard to get it out. Now we have um, folks that will picking that stuff out, but in your restaurants, for example, there's clamshells, straws, cups, if it's paper, great, put it in there. But if it's plastic, we're gonna ask you to try to remove it if you can, otherwise we'll have to remove it with our equipment. But um, some of that stuff will be more difficult to get out. So if you can help us remove the plastics and convert over to paper products and things, all the better. Commingo collection, if you have, and I mentioned this earlier, if you have a green waste service today, uh, going forward, you'll be allowed to mix your food scraps with your green waste containers. And so really not much will change container wise. It'll just be that you'll be able to add food to your container where it gets a little trickier and, and it will be where we have to source separate collection. And that means that you don't have green waste today, like a grocery store perhaps. And we're gonna ask you to put, uh, provide you a green waste container, likely a bin or a cart where you can put your food scraps, whether it be just raw food scraps or packaged materials, into that bin and we'll come by and service it uh, and take that back. Maybe we have to depackage it, but it'll all be combined with the green waste later in our facility to digest it and, and create those renewable resources. Tools for helping you separate the food. We really wanna help you inside your kitchens, inside your facilities where the food is being generated. If you think of a, a I talked about the residents, we're giving you this caddy, this gray caddy that you see here, uh, that's residential, but in an industrial setting or maybe a restaurant, you'll need something bigger. There are containers like a cart that we could bring into your facility to help you separate it there. We have a thing called uh, a Slim Jim, which is a, it's a, it's a, like a Rubbermaid uh, container that's a little smaller than a cart. It's easier to, to put in a kitchen somewhere where you can put your food scraps. The key is gonna be that separation takes place there if at all possible, because 
food scraps uh, mixed with trash or it doesn't help anybody. Uh, we got to change behaviors because in the kitchen, for example, um, today they're just throwing everything into one container and it's going in the trash. And we're gonna have to learn that we need a, a separate container for food scraps from the trash. And when you get good at it, uh, it's amazing how much less trash you have and, and how well we can separate organics uh, and do a good job with that. So we'll help with those containers and get you the right one to help you do the job well. There are other things that we'll be providing that EDCO provides is that we'll have, as I mentioned, a site uh, on-site um, guidance and resources to help you adjust your services properly. We're gonna provide you lots of outreach material and mailers, websites, social media connections, uh, and uh, just, just making sure that you get what you need to help not only you, but your employees know what to do. And then the record keeping and reporting, there's extensive record keeping and reporting required under this new law. Uh, it's often burdensome. We will help you do that. We'll help collect that information for you and get it reported to the right people. So you needn't worry too much about that, but just know that there's gonna be a lot more information that we will have to collect and report that's required in this regulation. Timeline, um, as I mentioned, the residential rollout is happening now, started this month. Uh, so over this month and next month, you'll see uh, more literature coming out and information, but we're helping folks get those caddies and get it and get uh, the food waste out of our kitchens and into our green waste bins. Commercially, we'll start with the outreach in April and June of this year. And then uh, and through May, July, we'll start with multifamily, expand it into the tier one, tier two, which again is the grocery stores and restaurants in July to December, the second half of this year. Um, you'll, you'll be hearing from us and the city will be putting out information as well. And then over the course of the next couple of years, there'll be a focus on the reporting, the food recovery that I mentioned of sharing food, and then also the enforcement side, which I don't want to talk about enforcement. And I think that really will be something that um, will, not us, the state has mandated it, but it'll be something the city of Vista will decide how well to, how strongly to, to push that on us all um, as, a, uh, as we get down the road. So that was a very fast uh, overview of this whole thing. I uh, want to just be available to answer any questions if there are some out there for me. Great. Jim, could I ask you to stop sharing your screen so I can see everybody? Um, thank you so much. So let's see. Um, <clears throat> so uh, my, my first question for you is um, with regard to the business outreach, um, you know, the chamber, we'd love to help support you. Edco has been such an amazing partner to the Vista Chamber. This is really exciting uh, information. And, you know, Edco has been a leader in this space uh, for a really long time. And um, I'm really just so grateful that we have Edco in our community. Um, thank you so much for that. So how can the chamber, how can we help you uh, connect with businesses and help the city and, and Edco get the word out about the upcoming uh, commercial process? and how can we help? Well, that's a great question. And thank you for that offer because uh, we really do need the uh, chamber and the business community to help us get the word out. Um, as I mentioned, this is gonna uh, continue to roll out through this year, uh, more so in the second half of the year. And so um, we love being able to do things like this. Uh, we, we're, we're happy to participate in any of your programs. Unfortunately, COVID's made it more challenging for all of us to uh, network and get together and talk about this, but we do want to get into the community. We want to do more um, presentations and uh, any place we can speak about this. Certainly, if we can provide links on your website uh, to connect and find information on this, if someone's looking, great. They tap into the, uh, the Chamber website and, and can get a, a link back to our, our site to maybe give you more information. But uh, we also want ears out there if you're hearing folks saying, hey, I don't understand this. I, uh, uh, I don't understand how it's gonna work. Uh, I have concerns. Uh, just letting us know so we can connect up with the, our fellow uh, chamber members, that would be great. Great, we are absolutely happy to do all of those things. And I know um, I'll continue to work with Margo on some of those specific tools and, and strategies. Um, we have a question from Steve Harrington. Steve, go for it. Thank you, Rachel. Hey, um, Jim, my wife was all over this. And I mean, she went on the website and she ordered a caddy and we've heard nothing, seen nothing. What's the timeline for getting this little, little feature? Well, um, the caddies are being delivered as we speak and they are, they, we were kind of overwhelmed with the request, which is a good thing, okay? Yeah. 
I mean, well over a thousand requests in a matter of a few weeks. So uh, we just doubled up our delivery teams and you should see something, uh, I would hope even this week yet, maybe the next week for sure. I, I was given strict instructions to find out. <laughs> Thank you very much, Jim. Well, we're glad you're participating. Thanks for making the effort. Um, I will say that um, in our home, we just have, an, we had an extra little trash can that we just started putting stuff in because our, our trash day is actually Monday, which was the first. And so we just had a separate trash can and started putting, putting things right in there um, while we wait for our caddy. So any other questions for Jim? I don't see any other questions. Thank you so much for being here. Again, we really appreciate our partnership with EDCO and appreciate all the things that you're doing in the sustainability space. Uh, thank you so much for being here. You're welcome to stick around. And yeah. we're going to hear next from Chris Megason, um, a CEO from uh, um, President, founder, and CEO of Solutions for Change. Chris, are you with us? Chris, are you with hey, us? Yes, I am here. Hold on. Hello. Can, hey, hi. Welcome. There you are. There's your face. How's it going? Yes. I'm doing great. How you? How are you? How are my friends from the Vista Chamber? We're hanging in there. Hanging in there. Awesome. Okay. Let me. Uh, can, Would you like you to share stage? your screen? Yes. Okay. You have. Should have permission to do so. All righty. Let me see that. Uh, <clears throat> I should have this like super down pat by now since I've only done this about 1800 times over COVID. Uh, <laughs> I know I said right, at the very beginning of the meeting that it's it's terrifying that I'm in charge of any kind of technology, but <laughs> I'm figuring it, I'm winging it, I'm making it happen. I know. I know, it's just like, uh, all right, hold on. I just want to make sure that I got this right here. All right, here we go. All Great, right. we can, can see that. Great, thank you. You can, you can see the uh, the Solutions for Change logo there. All right, great. All right, well, thank you for, for giving me the opportunity to share an update about Solutions for Change. Um, I know there's most of you here know quite a bit about us, but there might be a few folks that don't. So I'm going to cover us a little bit of our history, um, why we exist, and then I'll get into some of the recent um, updates, some of the things that we've been doing, um, and then hopefully leave lots of uh, opportunity for, for questions. Um, all righty, so I want to make sure that, because there we go. So can you see that next screen now where it says from this to this? I want to make sure that, okay, good, because I've, I've got three, believe it or not, I've, I feel like I'm on the Starship Enterprise with three screens here, and so sometimes, uh, Things aren't, don't show up the way I want them to. So uh, this is gonna be a, a quick update regarding the impact of Solutions for Change uh, presented to our friends here at the Vista Chamber of Commerce. You know, the, the picture on the left is typically the folks. So our customers, we have really two sets of customers. The first one is the homeless families that come to us. Uh, and the second is the you, the community. So what we've done is created a social contract between those two customers and Solutions for Change has developed uh, a, an approach that serves both of them in a way that delivers transformation. So I know many of you are familiar with our model and how we see things. Um, we've actually called ourselves Solutions for Change. I remember Dal Williams, uh, who was our board chair uh, in our first a couple of years, we founded in 1999. And I remember him saying, you know, we're not solutions for change. We're not solutions for the same old thing. We're solutions for change. And so really so we, what we've been doing over the last two plus decades uh, is creating a model that's based on really three fundamental elements, ground up, community-based and market-driven. So what I'm gonna share with you today is an organization that has created us a, a social enterprises. Um, and I'm going to share a little bit about how we've overcome some recent challenges related to 
some legislation that has been rolling out from the feds and the state over the last many years. And so, um, all right, so we'll get into it. Uh, I, I thought it was important to let you know that Solutions has been going through a fairly significant rebranding exercise. The logo that you saw in the beginning is um, some of you that know us are like, wait, what happened to the heart with the house in the middle? And uh, so we are, uh, we are right at the tail end of this rebranding. Our board of directors at our annual meeting just last week approved all this. And here's our new core values. We're using the acronym One Us, which is now uh, the name of our campaign moving forward. You know, um, maybe it's the old Marine in me, but I like to think uh, tactically through, ish, uh, through presenting campaigns to the community or initiatives. And we've just started one called We Are One Us. Um, and I'll be talking a little bit about the significance of that, but our core values, we own our actions, we embrace the gift of accountability, we never give up, we keep our commitments, we empower overcomers. Um, I, I like the word solutionizers, but my team talked me into like, look, Megas, and nobody knows what a solutionizer is, but everybody knows what an overcomer is. So we equip and we, we inspire those we serve. We have unbridled passion, we have a warrior spirit and a servant's heart, we live servant leadership. Our core, core focus, and you may start uh, seeing some things like the word homeless left out. And you're going to be one of the first groups, which is appropriate because we started here um, 30 years ago. Uh, you're going to be one of the first groups that are going to hear about some of these new changes. So we transform the nation's most vulnerable and dependent people into the most empowered, equipped, and inspired overcomers. And we have our niche. Our niche is that we strive, we're striving. Um, we know we're a ways from that, but we are striving to be the best at making and deploying overcomers to crush the churn of dependency and homelessness. So I like to say that in 30 years of us solving homelessness with this community of Vista, so this is our home city. Um, we're now in seven cities throughout the North County 78 corridor. It really comes down to what we've learned from two Vista homeless folks. Um, after losing that push-up bet, after the Gulf War, uh, they sent me to Vista and to, um, I wish I could tell you that it was like, hey, I'll volunteer to go serve in Vista at the soup kitchen. Um, but it was me losing a push-up bet after the Gulf War. And I met this gentleman here, his name is Steve. Uh, he grew up in Vista. His uh, mom and his dad were um, both fairly well-known folks. And uh, he lost both of them in a tragic situation when he was 19. And he jumped into a bottle of Jack Daniels. And I met the gentleman about 17 years later. Um, he was Vista's most prominent homeless person. This is a guy who pretty much everybody uh, would see. Um, he was a very angry gentleman. He was completely addicted uh, to drugs and alcohol. And, um, and so in talking and getting to know Wolf Manor, Steve, uh, we learned a few things. We started to see that there is this uh, enabling and this handout kind of culture. And these are a lot of well-meaning churches and you know, nonprofits and others that wanted to help guys like Steve because there's a lot of other homeless folks out there like him. Um, but it was just giving people stuff. We call it blankets and burritos. And it was creating this kind of dependency scenario, which then created this kind of victimhood dynamic. And so the churn, we, we began, we didn't call it the churn then, but we were seeing this dynamic and it was really a recidivism type of dynamic. People would get in and out of services to help the homeless, but we saw very few people actually getting out and, and getting jobs and doing better. And of course, as you know, in the nineties, before we started solutions, um, you know, we were, we were believers in this thing called social enterprise, partnering with, with the private sector, with business. So we partnered up with the Blade Citizen, that was then the Blade Citizen, who became the North County Times. And we started the first ever hawker program in the region. And we would get these guys up at, I would say, zero dark 30, very, very early. I would go out there with them. And uh, we would sell these things called these uh, newspapers. But the whole idea was learning how to work in teams. And as you know, the, you know, I could, talk quite a bit about one of my favorite social enterprises. 
but all of a sudden it, it turned into one of the most dynamic and successful newspaper hawking operations in the country. We were selling tens of thousands of newspapers a week. And what was a nonprofit fully dependent on government money, within five years, we were generating 90% of the nonprofit's revenue that would underwrite then the homeless folks going through our programs. And it became known as kind of the work to eat program um, or tough love is another word. I don't really like the tough love thing. I think it's more like real love. Um, and you'll hear a little bit more about how a lot of, we believe at Solutions that a lot of our compassion has been um, misused and exploited and something very damaging is happening to our society. But it wasn't really until 99 when I, when I met Jessica and you know, um, it's, we say Little Red Riding Hood trying to play off the wolf man and the Little Red Riding Hood. I don't know if I like that or not, but Jessica, uh, was homeless in a Vista shelter right across from City Hall in 1999. And she yanked on my sleeve one night in the sweetest innocent voice. She just says, hey, mister, do you live here too? And I'm there with my wife and my two teenage boys who were always mad at me because I would always make them go down to the shelter and help out. And she thought we lived on the shelter floor. And uh, I got down on one knee and I looked at her and told her I didn't live in the shelter with her and her mom and her baby sister, but that we were gonna get her out of there. And she teared up. And I'd be lying to you if I told you this old Marine didn't tear up. And in that second, that, that nine-year-old homeless girl launched Solutions for Change. Um, we had some very, really different opinions in terms of how uh, Alpha, what Alpha Project was doing in terms of their future. And we wanted to really start helping homeless families. So we left there. We started Solutions for Change on a wing and a prayer. And um, so I want to tell you with the company profile today, uh, we, um, uh, we started there at the All Saints Episcopal Church uh, on Eucalyptus. Um, today, uh, we have 300,000 square feet of real estate in seven cities that we own and operate. Um, we help over 600 um, homeless parents and their children every day. Um, and we're about a $6 million a year operation. And we've done all of this now. We're doing all of it on private revenue. So we're doing all of it in partnership with uh, the businesses of North County, the faith and churches, church center, the faith centers and churches, and the phil philanthropic organizations. But you know, Jessica, what we quickly learned about with Jessica was that the system was woefully inadequate to deal with and solve root causes. And we said, you know. Everybody's doing shelters and servicing programs for the homeless. We got to do something a lot different. So that's what we did. We struck out and we built something completely different um, because at the end of the day, what we saw was the same exact thing that we saw with Wolfman, but now it was coming after our kids. And we just were not going to allow that to happen. And it, it was really because of the people of Vista the heart of the people of Vista and frankly, the just all out roll up your sleeve. There's something about Vistans that's like, we're gonna roll up our sleeves, man. And we're gonna make this happen. And so with that, um, you, know, you know, we see all these images like what we see here, but, um, and there's a lot of that going on right now in our city, but we saw a lot of kids, a lot of families coming to us and so we, built these three different social enterprises. One's a personal development academy that we, uh, that we call a Solutions Academy. The other one is a, is a series of enter social enterprises with a farm and a real estate development company. And the other one is an institute that we call Solutions in the Community. These three different social enterprises, all funded through private uh, revenue, make up the entirety of what Solutions for Change brings to the, the Vista community. So, you know, our main campus is on West California Avenue. It's a 700 day full on leadership development academy that uses servant leadership. There's a ton to it. Many of you have been here and seen it. It is entirely different than what you would think uh, in that the current homelessness um, system uses. Um, we don't do shelters. We don't do, um, you know, handout programs, everything is around, how can we equip this person with the skills, knowledge and resources they need to transform their lives? And we take an education approach 
but we also take a practical application approach. So people are up working, learning, practicing out in the community and learning how to be givers instead of takers. So that's why we love servant leadership. And we were one of the first in the country to begin using that kind of curriculum within our program, our programmatic uh, engagements. Our farm, um, you know, it's, you've heard it's the largest aquaponics farming operation in the Western United States. It still is. You know, it's not a big farm. I mean, it's only two acres, but we're producing, um, you know, somewhere in the neighborhood of about 100,000 pounds of food a year. And uh, COVID hurt us on that. You know, we were selling to the restaurants and the schools. Um, so we did a pivot. They asked me, what do you want us to do with all this food, Mega? So we got, you know, tons of it and nobody's buying it. I said, box it up and give it away to other nonprofits. Give it to senior citizens. Give it, just, just get it out there. And we did that. And what came from that is a CSA program where now you can buy it online. You can go to our, non our website, and you can literally have a box of amazing organic food delivered directly to your door. Um, so that pivot and just kind of getting our food out there turned into that. Um, and, uh, and then we have, of course, our community development uh, in our, our institute. So this is the Coyote Cafe, one of our favorite places to eat. A lot of our graduates go there, our staff go there. The owners one day look at um, one of our graduates and with tears in her eyes, she says, I don't think we're going to make it. We're like, well, you can put your, you know, your tables out in the, um, out in the, uh, parking lot. And it's like, well, it's too tilted. You know, there's just, it won't work. We tried it. So five days later, those graduates who are the overcomers mobilized a whole bunch of other overcomers paid for all of it and built them this deck. Um, and uh, we got to thank the city of Vista. They, they just, you know, with Kevin there and uh, council member Green, we were able to go get through the process very quickly. The word got out and we did a couple more decks, one for um, Allen's Alley and another one for um, um, the other one that's right next to that sushi place. What's the name of that place? Anyway, y'all know what I'm talking about. All right. So very quickly, I know I'm getting kind of low on time. I, you know, a lot of people don't understand that there's a that there are different homeless folks out there. We kind of get that, but here's how we've learned it over 30 years. There's the cannot, the will not, and the have not. The cannot is severely mentally ill. These are schizophrenics. These are folks that are really diagnosed with severe mental illness. The will not are addicts, uh, people that have uh, experienced a lot of trauma, but who can work and who will work if, if they get their addiction treated and they get some help. And then there's the have nots, these are the economically displaced. Well, here's what the state did. They said, we think it's all a housing issue and access to housing issue. So we're gonna treat all of it with this new one size fits all top down system called housing first. And, and so this is a massive misdiagnosis um, in our opinion. Um, and many others have this opinion. There's actually uh, an increasing number of evidence that's showing that this was the wrong diagnosis and the wrong plan. So what Solutions has said is, is um, we need to use this empowerment approach, which solves root causes, and especially for the 75%. And this is frankly what we specialize in. We specialize in converting the will not into somebody who will take help, will allow us to come alongside of them and go through this empowerment program. And the way we do this is through this, what we're calling a systems change effort. It's a 700 day engagement. It's roughly two years. And what we see is everybody that comes into solutions in day one is turns into a dot in our evaluation system here, which is a representation right here on the screen in the bottom left, they're, they're heavily dependent and they are very unhealthy and their well-being is, is low numbers. So really our job is to get them from dependency and negative health to interdependency, being employed and healthy. And we do that in 700 days through our academy. Now there's a lot to it, obviously. Um, we've created an evaluation system um, and we use a number of methodologies and evidence-based interventions. The, the therapeutic community model 
Uh, we use peer support, and we also do some restorative justice. These are all evidence-based models that we've merged together um, and used. So our stuff is evidence-based, and we call this thing the Systems Change Initiative through We Are One Us, and here's what we're trying to do. We're trying to make overcomers and crush the churn. That's our vision and purpose. So we're taking people from the churn and we're putting them through this, this series of interventions and engagements using these three, um, these three uh, different social enterprises. And then we're, we're hiring these folks and redeploying them back into the community to pull more people out of the churn. So it's kind of an anti-churn. And so we've been doing this now for quite some time and we're calling this effort, We Are One Us. What occurred is that we got discovered three years ago by a presidential appointee, Clarence Carter, that runs welfare for the country or, or did for the last several years. And, uh, and after searching the country, they came up with five nonprofits that would demonstrate the antithetical uh, effort to the current top-down system. And I was the dummy that raised my hand first for the first demonstration. That was supposed to start after 18 elected officials signed a proclamation um, in November of, 19, uh, of 2019. Um, but with COVID, it was delayed. We ended up launching it in October with 21 of our overcomers. Um, and so now we're in We Are One Us. We are at the tail end of phase one. Phase two starts in April. We're gonna go on a blitz of all out education campaigns while we're taking people out of the churn. Our goal is to take 550 parents and their kids out of the churn over the next uh, three years and transform their lives through the academy and the various different um, interventions that I just showed you. So we are a systems disruptor. Um, we make no excuses for that. We think that the current system, um, they're not doing this obviously on purpose, but the current system here, the current way that the system looks at it is a top-down one size fits all. They passed SB 1380 which became law. We were the first state in the entire United States that actually made the way to help a homeless person one very narrow way through this thing called Housing First. So we think that the issue for a lot of people isn't access to housing, it's untreated addiction and mental illness, mental health issues. That if, if we just put them in housing, then it's a containment kind of approach versus solving root causes which we do at Solutions for Change. So we're excited to continue to be here and this is our home, Vista. Um, we help a lot of people now in multiple different cities. Uh, and by the way, I gotta tell you, I'm really excited to have Christy Knight on our team. I've known Christy for 13 years when I met her when she was working with Bill Horn. And um, she thought she was gonna be around in the county for a little bit longer, but I gotta tell you, I'm kind of happy that uh, that worked out that way because she has such a passion for this mission and for this vision. So she is our new vice president of community engagement. And I've asked her, hey, would you uh, kind of like be our, I, I wasn't, I was on the Vista chamber board for a while with Brett. And um, I think Christy will do a much better job in terms of being the liaison but, and, uh, so I've asked her if she would help with that and um, in whatever capacity that you all uh, would like, and she's happy to do that. So I'll stop here um, and open it up for any questions. And I apologize if I went too long. I'm not looking at my clock. So, uh, so that's, that's what I got. Um, thank you for letting me come in and, and, uh, and share some about Solutions for Change. This is one of our families here. I love the kid with the Coke bottle glasses. He's one of my favorite kids. Um, that's Ron and Amanda, and um, they live in permanent housing, one of our graduate families. So thank you and take any questions if you have it. Thank you, Chris. Um, if I could ask you to stop sharing your screen just so I can see everybody in case there's hands up. Thank you, that helps me. Um, so I have, um, first of all, thank you for the presentation. It's great to hear from you and um, to hear from such a, a long time VISTA organization that's doing such great work. I'm also glad to hear that Christy's on your team. I also know, have known her for quite a while um, when she was with Supervisor Horn's office and I'm 
glad to hear that she can be in the mix working with us here at the chamber. So I'm going to be reaching out to you, Christy, um, just a heads up on that. Um, but I did have a question. And, you know, I feel like a homelessness and is getting is becoming more and more visible, more and more visible to just the general person. Um, over the last several years, um, people are saying homelessness is getting worse. So in your opinion, is homelessness the problem getting worse or is it becoming just more visible? Or um, maybe you can speak to that just briefly. Yeah, I get asked that question a lot. Is absolutely getting worse. The numbers state that. Um, as you've heard, uh, just in the last couple of years, the numbers um, uh, in LA County and the Bay Area um, have gone up significantly. Um, anywhere from like 18% all the way up to like 25% in some of those areas. And the reason is, and every business owner on this call right now will understand this, is, um, is that every company, or if it's a legislative program or uh, and a, a way to help the homeless, every company is perfectly designed to get the results that they're getting. So the results that the state of California right now are getting are more homeless and not only more homeless, but if you've noticed the impacts, the suffering, the human suffering is much greater. So we're seeing people that are suffering um, much greater and we're seeing more of them. And that is because of the design. And if, and if we don't start changing this design, um, you can throw a billions and billions and billions, which is now what the state is doing, um, unfortunately, into the wrong design. And it's, it's not going to solve the real root problems of this. So not everyone has addiction, obviously, and we hear this, you know, but I will tell you, we understand this population. We're, we've been doing it for three decades. So we, we get it, right? Uh, we've been out to the camps in Vista, uh, we've been to the valleys and the camps in Oceanside and all over. And I'm telling you, I would say minimum 85% of the people that we encounter on the streets are there with an active addiction and methamphetamine and heroin. And I got to tell you, the fentanyl is scary. Um, it, it is, it is unbelievable. I mean, it, it's, it is really bad. So, I mean, we talked to our our elected officials about this, they, they know um, what's out there, many of them. Um, and I think, you know, the state's gone all in, uh, you know, it's law, so it is a law. And, and as you know, in order for us to maintain our core values around solving root causes, we had to give up all of our state and federal money in 2015. And that's a shame because it's not hurt, it, it, yeah, it hurts solutions as an organization, although we did recover um, from it but it's really disenfranchising our families. The ultimate victims here, the ultimate ones being hurt are the people that are homeless out there. And I gotta tell you, we've been, we've been, Christy's gonna, she's gonna blow some stuff up, I think, because we've been asking for numbers of overdose deaths because the Bay Area has been coming out with reports showing that people, the homeless people that they're just sticking, you know, in these, in these motels and hotels and in housing behind a door are dying in record numbers. I'm talking about 380% increase in overdose deaths, right? In, up in San Francisco in the Bay Area. So we know this stuff is happening down here. And this is because we're not addressing the root causes. And so we are gonna continue to see an increase in homelessness. You can't build the five to $700,000 per unit cost um, apartments quick enough um, you, you're not going to build your way out of homelessness, not here in California. So um, I hope our friends, I know our friends, you know, I know our friends like Aaron, um, you know, and, and Haley and others. There's a lot of people that are in this community that understand this. Um, and I, I, we're continually, we are getting a lot, we are getting some interesting heat, you know. Um, because we're not part of the system. So we can say things that maybe others would be afraid to say. 
And it's not that we want to, you know, I want to play nice in that sandbox. I don't know if Aaron wants me in his sandbox, but I can play nice with Aaron in his sandbox. We want to be in people's sandboxes. We want, but we are not going to be part of the system that continues to contain it and try to manage it when this isn't a housing problem, it's a human being problem. And we've got to do something different here, or this is gonna, this is getting overrun. We used to have kind of like a we kind of were protected, but now the North and the South um, policies are squeezing us. So thank you for the question. And, um, you know, we really, we, we are partners with y'all and we, we're going to try to, well, not try, by doing these serve to solve projects, you're going to start seeing something here that's really exciting. We're going to, we're going to take our people and we're going to start serving you. Um, it's about service to others. And so we're gonna get out there. We're gonna keep helping these businesses. We're gonna keep doing things. I don't wanna be professional deck builders, but we're gonna help the Vista business community. We're gonna to continue to do that. Our overcomer is gonna get out there. And here's why they did it. When we had nothing, they said, nothing. We had nothing. You, Vista, hired them and you helped them through your goods and services and donations to solutions. So you were there for them in their lowest, darkest times. And it's really simple to them now. You were there for them. They wanna be there for you now for the business community. And so um, hell, you know, we, want, we want to do this with you this next year. You're gonna start seeing a lot of really cool projects that Christy and Tanya and others will bring forward. So we hope that um, we hope that you'll help us with that and that you'll let us help you in that. So thank you. Thank you so much. Thanks, Chris. Um, any other questions? Go ahead, Haley. Thank you. Hi, Chris. Hi, Christy. Congrats on gaining Christy. You're lucky. <laughs> um, no, I just want to say, I love what you guys do. I know you know I'm a big champion of you guys. And I just want to understand, I think living in Oceanside, being a part of communities along the 78 corridor and Vista, it seems like you were saying addiction is such a big part of what contributes to homelessness. What have you seen as kind of the major reason why they want to cross? Like what, how, how do they get to the epiphany that they don't want to be homeless anymore and that they do need help and that to be clean and to get into treatment? Like, how do you get more people to be inspired to want to go along that path? And then I guess along that same line, how do you encourage cities or policymakers to make the right kind of changes to facilitate that happening? Great question. You know, Aaron really understands this. I, I've got to know Aaron over the years. And so a little self-disclosure, but I would tell you that the answer is there is, a, there is an underbelly of enabling and codependency that is so pronounced and so it's it's operationalized now and it's institutionalized. And so um, no self-disclosure, raised in Michigan, oldest of five, alcoholic father, codependent mom. Um, I get out, join the Marine Corps, like, oh, thank God, I'm, I didn't get the alcoholic gene. Next thing I know, I'm marrying an alcoholic. It blows up, you know, and I learned that I'm a codependent. Like I got the, my, I got the mom side of it. My mom was a codependent and I learned all about codependency. Here's the thing. And I got great training education around this addiction on one side of the coin codependency on the other side one can't exist without the other so all these addicts that are out there that are hurting and suffering right you can't stay in your addiction without codependence right and so even though it's counterintuitive we have to let people you know experience the pain and and, and the hurt and some people say well isn't being homeless painful and hurtful enough well, yeah, but if all, if you got an institution and, and a lot of people that are, that are feeding them and giving them stuff and more stuff and more stuff and more stuff, they don't experience, you know, that moment where we can get to them easier. So there's others like us, but you can get to that person and have that conversation, which I did in Vista for years, the, the single folks um, before helping families. And, and, and you, can, you can get them to make that decision. So I, I got to tell you, and we, you know, there's not enough time, but codependency, Aaron knows this, as he's a, he's a master at, at studying this, codependency, I believe, is the real issue. We'll always have addicts, we'll always have alcoholics, 
but codependency, i.e. this enabling force that has now got billions of dollars to fuel it is literally what's, help, what's killing us. So we've got to get to our legislators who got sold this lock, stock and barrel thing about um, the, the, the diagnosis is, you know, is not enough housing. You know, yeah, we need more housing, but for these addicts and these folks that are suffering, we need, they're untreated. So we need, we need interventions that treat the illness. This is a treatable illness. This isn't a death sentence. People can get well and they do all the time. So thank you for that question, Haley. I appreciate that. I hope that was uh, not too much self-disclosure. I, I, uh, I'm a Michigander at heart, so I know there might be one or two of you out there, but uh, thank you. Thank, thank you so much, Chris. I really appreciate you being here today and sharing a bit about what's going on with Solutions for Change and um, some new information for some folks and then a refresher for others. And I'm excited to hear um, all about what's happening and, and to stay engaged with you all. So thank you so much for being here. We are gonna move into our um, updates from our governmental agencies. So we'll start, uh, Amanda Lee, we will start with you, City of Vista. Are you there, Amanda? I'm here and now I don't, I, of course, technology. Um, there, there I am. You are. Hi, how are you today? Um, so I just have really some quick updates, um, some exciting news. The city is applying for two grants, um, state park grants, um, and their um, first park is a kind of a neighborhood pocket park. So that means it's kind of a smaller park in the town site region. And the second park is much larger. It's um, proposed to be a joint dog park and general recreation. That one's off of Breeze Hill Road. Parking is to be included. That's a, a hot um, question. And um, I encourage everyone to go onto our website to cityofvista.com new parks to complete a survey. So you can provide your input on what features to potentially include in there. And that grant application will be submitted on, um, it's going to council for um, approval for us to submit a grant application. We have to get that approval first on March 9th, assuming council approves us to request for money um, is probably gonna go through. And so that grant is going to be um, submitted March 12th. So you can put in your comments all the way up until that date. Um, in addition, the city is looking for input around our city's environmental review for both the housing element um, negative declaration and also our climate action plan negative declaration. Both documents are available on the public's um, website, on our website, and you can do review. Um, the public review time are listed within the documents, but generally end at the end of March. And we'll likely be bringing the housing element forward to city council in April or May and the climate action plan in for discussion in the spring timeframe. Um, just general updates. Um, the CVBID annual levy public hearing is agendized for March 23rd meeting. And um, council approved as um, Rachel and others know the Vista Economic Development Strategy on February 23rd. Kevin is currently working, I believe with you, Rachel, to um, provide a presentation to the group. And I believe that will either be in April or May. Um, the city is also working with two new uses to come into our downtown, which if they move in, it will bring more vibrancy to our downtown area. With that being said, also our downtown is really kind of coming back um, to life uh, right now. Weekends do tend to get a little bit busy and our weekdays are doing well as well. And then RPG, um, they're a full service commercial real estate firm um, that acquires and owns, um, develops industrial and office and residential areas. They recently acquired One Viper Way, which is a 203,000 square foot. And the city is working with them on potential new tenants. And lastly, the San Diego Food Bank in North County, which is in Vista, is working on food distributions for serving industry families. And that will be announced soon. And that is my city updates. Thank you, Amanda. Any questions for Amanda? I was just gonna say, I'm, I'm really interested in the new parks that are coming in uh, to Vista. And I talked with um, council member Green uh, and sent him some videos about some ad adaptive and inclusive recreation opportunities that may exist. 
for potentially putting in parks that are accessible for children with disabilities. Okay. So I think that'd be pretty interesting. And Aaron, did you fill out the survey? No, I haven't got, I hadn't, I didn't know that that was out there yet. So I just found out from you, so. Okay, yeah, if you could definitely put that on the survey and just to kind of let you know that the survey is just, um, we're at the stage right now where we're applying for that grant application. So we don't have to, we kind of have to get a cost estimate on what the general will be. So when we're, we're filling out this application, but after, let's be positive, once we get awarded, um, then we'll go through the design phase. So there'll also be more, um, more involvement at well at that time as well to like really finalize what we're going to be putting in the parks and des definitely accessibility is really important to us and important to the community as well and we've heard it in the Paula Vista and Bub Williamson parks too. Um, I know Paula Vista is going to have a little bit more of the sensory accessibility elements. I know that people in the community were also looking for more of like the swings and other type of like wheelchair accessible units as well. So that's definitely um, in there. And the more people that can talk about it in the surveys, the, the more that will bring it up and we can kind of include those cost metrics into the grant as well. Um, Amanda, yeah. will, you, will you put a link to the survey in the chat? I'll make sure and grab it and, and we can push that out as well. Will do, thank you. Thank, thank you. All right, next up, Crystal Jabara, County Supervisor Desmond's office. Good afternoon, everyone. I hope everyone's doing well. I get to see people multiple times today, so it's, <laughs> it's always fun. Um, things are moving along. Obviously, COVID is still the number one priority in the county right now. Uh, the governor spoke this afternoon. We were hoping that we were going to hear some announcements about some changes to the qualifications of the tiers. We know that there are a lot of rumors floating around, and we're hoping that um, with the tier system, they're going to take into consideration the amount of vaccines that are being issued in a county, and that will impact what tier you're in. So if that is the case, we are hoping that we will have um, some more industry sectors opened up very soon, but we're still waiting to hear. Um, Board of Supervisors meetings this week, we allocated, made allocations at the supervisor to the first round of community enhancement grants. The City of Vista, their nonprofits were awarded more than $30,000 worth of uh, grants in this first go around. So if you know of any uh, nonprofits that would like to apply, make sure they put in their applications for either community enhancement or neighborhood reinvestment grants. So we'd love helping out our nonprofits because they do so much for the communities like the Chamber of Commerce, who does so much to support businesses within this community and even businesses outside of the community, they never refuse anyone help. So we appreciate that. Um, also working, um, the board approved to make better efforts to imp improve infrastructure that's impacted during power shutoffs. And I'm pretty sure I saw Katie on the, um, the meeting, sdg &E does the power shutoffs when there's uh, fire danger and extreme wind events. And we have found that it impacts some of the infrastructure like lights. So if you have to evacuate and your lights aren't working, it becomes difficult. Or even if there is no fire, but just a power shutoff and those um, backup batteries for our intersection lights only last 24 hours, sometimes less, um, that creates a, a pretty serious hazard out in the back countries, especially in the darker areas. So working to make some more improvements infrastructure wise for the county. Um, vaccines, I learned great things today from Aaron and from Amber from Scripps. We've been having a lot of issues because the educational community, those that work for school districts have to go through VBA to get their vaccinations. And we've, we've gotten a lot of, um, angry calls and emails because they're frustrated because they are not qualified yet to receive their vaccine through those sites. It's very frustrating, especially for people that are actually on campus or in the classroom working. And I have found out that Tri-City, Scripps, other medical providers are allowing them to make appointments there. As long as they are in a qualified tier, they're allowed to have a vaccine. And I can say fabulous things about Tri-City and their vaccination. And I'm sure Aaron will talk about that, but I highly recommend that if you're struggling to get your vaccine, it's a great alternative and probably a less frustrating one. Uh, a lot of other things going on. So if you um, 
have questions about anything specific, go ahead and reach out. I'll put my contact information in the chat section. Crystal, any, anybody have a question for Crystal? Nope. Okay, well then we will move on to Congressman Mike Levin's office. Kyle, how's it going? Not, not too much going on with you guys, right? <laughs> Very quiet, yeah, no. Um, it's good to see you all. Um, yeah, the Congressman is still in DC. Um, he's been there for votes last week. Uh, he voted on the American Rescue Plan. Um, and then he should be coming back home tomorrow. Um, we're going to do a press conference down south. But um, that will also do the American Rescue Plan just to highlight some of the uh, really important things in there. So just, you know, I've mentioned a few of those before to y'all, but I want to make sure to really highlight the small business programs that are in there. Um, we all know about the Economic Injury Disaster Loan Program that SBA put out at the beginning of the pandemic. Um, this adds another $15 billion to that. And then, of course, we're familiar with the PPP Paycheck Protection Program. That's another $7 billion for that. Um, it also expands eligibility um, for the PPP uh, to get more businesses available to be able to uh, get access to that program. Again, we're just trying to get through these next few months. We keep hearing, you know, vaccines are coming. So, um, you know, hopefully these programs will be the last time we have to up these. Um, there is a piece of this bill, though, that we didn't get in some of the last packages, and that's specifically targeted relief for restaurants. Um, as we know, the service sector has been particularly hard hit. Um, and so this actually includes a $25 billion fund that restaurants can apply for that's grants, not loans. Um, and that's modeled after a bill that the congressman has been strongly supportive of called the Restaurants Act. Um, we're still pushing for that bill. Um, that would be 109 billion. So this is 25 billion in this bill, that's great. But um, you know this sector particularly needs some help. So we're gonna keep trying to push for the full bill. Um, and that you know will provide grants to businesses, but also has a set aside for smaller businesses, those you know, gross, gross less than $500,000 um, in 2019. So. Hopefully that will help those ones specifically. And then I also just wanna mention um, an important part of it that the Congressman has been fighting hard for, which is direct aid for local cities. A lot of our cities aren't big enough to have qualified for that direct aid that came in past stimulus bills. Um, and uh, our cities in North County specifically have been hit particularly hard on their budgets um, because of the reduction in transit occupancy tax, just sales tax going down and things like that. So um, this actually, the American Rescue Plan does include specific direct funding for uh, our local cities, Vista would get 26 million, um, which, you know, I mean, if you're familiar with the city's budget, that's a, that is a, a significant chunk that will be able to keep a lot of workers um, on the job, providing our basic services um, and continue to be able to spend their salaries in the community. And then I'll transition from that to mention what's probably gonna be coming up next. We expect the Build Back Better plan. That's uh, President Biden's infrastructure plan. Um, so it'll invest in infrastructure manufacturing um, and we are really pushing also to include some more support for small businesses, but um, the congressman has been really trying to focus in on what projects locally we can be pushing for that can be shovel ready, that could be eligible for funding under that program. We have a lot of um, delayed uh, maintenance, you know, different projects that really should have been done in the past and been waiting kind of for a federal infrastructure bill uh, for years now. So this we're hoping will be that opportunity um, and we will, are also focusing for primarily on one big project for the region. Um, that's the Los Sand Rail Corridor um, that goes through the Del Mar Bluffs. So the Los Angeles, Los Angeles, San Diego, San Luis Obispo is the entire rail corridor we have. But um, that Del Mar Bluffs segment is so vulnerable. As we all know, there was another slide over the weekend. So um, the Congressman you know, has been working hard to get stabilization for that. Um, we've been successful in that regard. But stabilization is just what it says. It's just a short term, near term, I should say. Um, fix. We need a longer term solution. And so Sandag and other regional uh, entities are working on a relocation of the tracks, probably going to be something like a tunnel through Del Mar. Um, multi-billion effort, but, you know, multi-billion dollar effort that will pay off because if this uh, rail corridor were to have to be shut down, uh, we're talking about a massive amount of money, hundreds of millions of dollars that would be lost because of the amount of freight that goes through there. I think a lot of us think of the coaster and the Amtrak, you know, that's what we interact with. But, you know, when we hear those big freight trains coming, there's significant amounts of commerce that uh, tra traverses that rail corridor. So we need to make sure that we have that for the future. And then finally, I'll just uh, close with uh, Congressman's uh, committee assignment. We got back on the House Veterans Affairs Committee, which we're very excited to be able to stay on there and was elected by his peers to serve as the vice chair. Um, is only a sophomore in Congress. Um, to be vice chair of a committee is pretty cool. And he's going to continue to also have the gavel as the chair of the uh, subcommittee on economic opportunity under the Veterans Affairs as well. Um, so you can continue advancing legislation in that specific regard um, and just in general obviously fighting for our veterans who deserve our help so that covers most of it happy to answer any questions as always so i'll pass it back to you rachel 
Thank you, Kyle. And I think it was so lovely to hear the birds chirping in the background <laughs> of your, I don't know where you are. I mean, you maybe obviously you're at the beach, so it's, it's lovely. Oh, it's my back door. It's it. I can't complain. <laughs> yeah. Fantastic. Uh, any questions for Kyle? Go ahead, Steve. Kyle, um, I'll preface my question this way. One of the challenges we face, at least in my opinion, is that the electorate is just not real well informed about a lot of different topics that they are voting for. And so that leads to my question. I, I, I'm just real curious as to the congressman's logic in voting yes for the amendment to HR1 that would expand voting to 16 year olds. That's a great question, Chris. I, Steve, sorry. And I don't have the answer right away, um, you know, because I didn't talk to him about that uh, to be able to tell you why he voted for that. I know that it was a split vote. I think something like 56% of the Democratic caucus uh, voted for it. So it wasn't unanimous on the Democratic no, side. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, so go ahead. I'm sorry. Well, I was just going to say, I, I'll get back to you on it if that's all right. And I'll, I'll make sure to get a specific answer about what the logic was. I'm sure somebody from his legislative team recommended it. Obviously, the congressman sure has his own personal direct feelings and probably led to his vote for it, but I'll get you an actual, actual specific answer. Kyle, I would appreciate that because I'm just trying to understand why 125 people voted for it. I, I mean, all I can do is think of myself at 16, a sophomore in high school, voting on a tax bill. It makes no sense. Anyway, gotcha. that's no, personal. Okay. I'll get back to you on that one for sure. Thanks, Steve. Thank you, right. Kyle. Thank you. All right, let's move along. Um, we are um, cranking right along here with, um, let's hear from Senator Pat Bates' office, Matthew Pye. Thank you, Rachel. Uh, good to see everyone. Um, so on the state Senate side, uh, we've seen actually quite a bit of progress on many fronts uh, since our last meeting. Um, I know I mentioned the senators work uh, with a group called Let's Play California uh, when it comes to uh, youth sports and relaxing those guidelines and making sure we can get our kids back uh, to playing sports, uh, both for their physical and mental health. Uh, so we've seen progress on that front uh, from the governor's office. We've also seen progress on um, school openings um, a little bit um, and how we'll be moving forward with that. Um, so it's very uh, interesting to see um, how big of a difference an impending recall can make and how much progress gets done. <clears throat> um, on the legislative side, though, I will uh, talk about the senator's uh, bill that we spoke about before, um, SB 74. This was the Keep California Working Act. Um, so as uh, you'll remember when I mentioned it before, uh, this was uh, the senator's bill with several other uh, members of the legislature uh, that took the legislative analyst's office um, estimate of a uh, surplus uh, for the state budget. I know that sounds uh, surprising, uh, but it was a surplus uh, estimate and taking that money and putting it back into COVID relief for both our small businesses and our nonprofits. Um, and very happy to say that the governor agreed with us um, and has included that in his budget um, moving forward. Uh, so we're excited about that. We think it's gonna be able to help uh, quite a few businesses here, small businesses in California, as well as nonprofits. Um, but also um, to tail back on that, um, the Senator is also in support of SB 265. <clears throat> this is a bill that would address making the state and federal COVID relief dollars uh, free from tax liability. Uh, so something that we've heard the most from our small businesses and nonprofits is it's great that we've received a lot of relief, but now um, there's talk or there's a potential for being taxed on that. Um, and so we certainly don't want to see that happen um, and want to do everything we can. So SB 265 uh, would address that specific issue um, with COVID relief dollars. Um, other than that, I uh, just want to reiterate our uh, office's commitment to be helping constituents with unemployment issues. Um, it's still been very, very difficult. Uh, we've definitely been seeing delays in responses um, or just cases being resolved. Um, our office still has several hundred cases. So uh, please direct any constituents that are having trouble with that uh, to our office. We'd be happy to look into that and uh, assist in any way that we can. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you, Matthew. Okay. Sulema. Assembly member Tasha Brenner Horvath's office. Hi there. Good afternoon, Thanks for your everyone. Patience. Nice to see everyone again. No, no worries. Um, so, just a brief update on my end. Um, I think the main thing that I wanted to touch on is the um, the California Small Business COVID nineteen Relief Grant program. Um, as you might know, um, the 
state just allocated an additional $2.1 billion to the program, um, which essentially quadruples the already existing investment. Um, and I just kind of wanted to briefly break down, um, you know, the distribution process for any business owners that might be um, with us today. So just yesterday, uh, GoBiz announced um, that the third round uh, of grants will run, uh, will begin running uh, this Friday through March 11th. Um, it is a closed round though, so uh, anyone who was waitlisted in the first, the second rounds um, will be the only uh, ones considered for this round. Um, and then round four will be dedicated to nonprofits and cultural institutions only. Uh, so it's important to also note, though, that um, if any nonprofits or cultural institutions, um, you know, they do fall within this category um, that have already applied in the first two rounds, um, they will need to submit an application uh, once again. And so that round will be open um, beginning March 16th uh, through the 23rd. Um, and then just for anyone who, you know, may not have received uh, any funding in any of the first three rounds around uh, or four, four rounds rather, uh, round five um, will be open for new applicants entirely. So that's set to open on March 25th. Um, and if you know anyone would like further information on that um, or you know the application process, um, feel free to visit um, careliefgrant.com or you know get in touch with SBDC. They're a great, great resource. Um, our office works with them a lot. We're always you know. Uh, referring business owners um, to the organization. And of course, Rachel and her team at the Vista Chamber are also um, incredible um, in assisting as well. Um, on a separate note, um, you may have heard that the uh, uh, assembly member um, was recently appointed by the, um, by the Speaker of the Assembly as Assistant Majority Leader for Policy and Research. Um, so this is an exciting new leadership role that she's taken on. Um, you know, where she'll be able to better collaborate with her colleagues um, in, you know, just con conducting some meaningful research, um, creating, you know, just meaningful policy all around, not only for the district, but for Californians as a whole. So very excited about this new leadership role. Um, in terms of what's going on in the district, um, we do have two upcoming events, uh, virtual. Uh, so our first um, will be um, this coming Tuesday, actually, March 9th from 4 to 5 p.m. We are partnering with SBDC to uh, share information on what type of aid is currently available to small businesses. Um, so feel free to RSVP for the webinar. Um, it's on our website. I'll go ahead and include the link in the chat box below. Um, some of the things that will be discussed will be, um, you know, the services that SBDC offers for um, minority owned businesses and just businesses as a whole, uh, current federal assistance, and of course, um, you know, what should be expected about the new um, state relief funds for small businesses. Um, and then the second event that we are hosting uh, this month toward the end of the month is our annual Women of Impact event. We are currently holding uh, accepting nominations for that. So um, if, you know, any woman that lives, works uh, within uh, AD 76, feel free to nominate them. Um, you know, we are uh, accepting those nominations through this Monday, uh, March 8th. That nomination form is on our website as well. So go ahead and nominate anyone who you would like. Um, and again, the event will be held uh, toward the end of the month. So feel free to join um, that event as well. Um, and as always, you know, our office can assist with any state agency. Uh, we're also still working with the EDD. Uh, we have seen an uptick in um, uh, casework as well with the Board of Registered Nurses. Um, so if, you know, anyone is having any trouble with the board, feel free to, re uh, you know, refer them to our office. We are um, in constant communication with the board as well to get some of those issues uh, resolved. But uh, that should be it for me today. Thanks, Rachel. Thank you so much. Okay, Erin. You have have anything to share with us today? Sure, uh, just a couple of things. We continue to vaccinate folks in the community. We opened up. We've been vaccinating healthcare providers and then people over the age of sixty five for some time, and then when as of last Saturday, I guess we opened up for vaccinating educators, law enforcement, grocery workers, informal caregivers, things of that nature. Uh, we have so far since we started this vaccinated uh, over 10,000 people in North County at our vaccination clinic at the hospital. We also send the vaccination response team of seven nurses out to the Cal State San Marcos super site every day. 
uh, to help in that regard. Uh, we have our own website. It's on our tricitymed.org website. If you click up on the top, you can go and, and uh, if you want to pass that on to anybody who uh, wants to sign up uh, for a vaccine, uh, for a vaccine. Um, things have been going pretty well. Average throughput time is 22 minutes, including the 15 minutes that you spend being observed after you get the, uh, the, the shot. So that's a, that's a pretty good turnaround time. Five-star ratings pretty much across the board on Google and Yelp, so that's really good. Um, so that's what we're doing with vaccines. And then we're also very heavily working on our 60th anniversary. We're gonna be celebrating that this summer. So uh, you've seen around town, the proudly serving our community since 1961 for some time that's leading into the 60th anniversary campaign. We're gonna do a Healthcare Heroes campaign, posters at the hospital of various people that work at all levels of the organization. We're renaming the towers at the hospital. They're no longer gonna be called South, Center and North. They'll be called Carlsbad, Oceanside and Vista uh, pavilions. So naming them after the cities around here. Very good. And then we're also putting in a history wall at the hospital to track this legacy that, we, that we're very proud of at the organization. And so there's gonna be a lot of cool, fun stuff coming. Uh, we're just working around, <laughs> we're working around uh, COVID and trying to do these things. We're also doing a lot of fundraising because we, um, we've already received $1.2 million in, grant, in, in, in a grant to help redevelop the emergency department at the hospital. So for a remodel of the front side of the emergency department, we're raising money for that. We're doing a series of events. Tri-City Hospital Foundation's doing those. I'm co-leading one of them, which is going to actually be uh, a home run derby uh, fundraiser. So people can participate in the home run derby and raise money for, for that project and things like that. So lots of cool, fun stuff. Uh, I know we're out of time, so I'll, I'll leave it there. Aaron, thank you. And we'll have you back for a longer update. Um, right. So you can dig into some of those things. Okay, we have one minute. And I'm wondering if John Osborne wants to say anything about what's going on with at and Hi, uh, good afternoon, Rachel, everyone. Um, <clears throat> as far as the legislature is concerned, you know, most of the bills are, are in for review and there are 32 different broadband bills um, that would uh, potentially have impact to our company. So we're in the process of evaluating those and looking at those um, as well as some service quality measures and, and metrics and things. So um, I'll be back uh, if there's anything that we would uh, like the business community to evaluate and weigh in on. Um, but uh, other than that, we're rocking and rolling and providing service and keeping our cell service up. So uh, everything everything is as good as it can be in a COVID era. Thank you, John. Katie, did you have anything to share? Okay, go. I just had a quick thing, and this is hot off the press because we just released a press release like 30 seconds ago about this, but um, we um, actually were able to successfully get the high usage charge removed. So if, for those of you that might not be familiar with it, it was impacted about 10% of our customers. And usually during the summer times, it's when folks are using more energy and it was kind of designed um, in a way to uh, penalize people by spiking up the price of electricity. And we had been advocating for the past couple of years to get this removed. Um, and we're able to successful in that endeavor. Um, so it'll be removed before the summertime of this year um, to really help stabilize bills for our customers. So um, just wanted to share that quick update. And then one other positive thing is um, last year we were able to spend just with all of our different suppliers over $2 billion into the local economy. Uh, over 40% of that is with small and diverse suppliers, um, which makes up $872 million. So I'll also send you some more information about that, um, Rachel, because a lot of that makes up some of chamber members and things of that nature. So that's it for me. Well, well please do send me that information. Uh, we'd love to help share that. and. That's a great way to end the meeting. So on that, those two great pieces of news. So thank you so much, everyone, for joining us. It is exactly 1.30. We did it. Thank you guys so much. We'll see you back here, April. I already have two awesome speakers lined up for you, but I'm not going to tell you who they are yet until I send out the agenda. All right. Have a good one.